Diets and workouts, you've done the work, so why can't you get to your goal weight? That's because up to 70% of your weight is predetermined by your genetics. So while you've been told that it's all about your willpower, you're actually fighting your biology. Don't do it alone. Found's doctor designed program uses medication as part of a treatment plan that targets your body's unique biological needs so that your body works with you and not against you. Take the quiz at joinfound.com to see if Found's weight loss program is right for you. So I'm a father of one. I gotta find a babysitter. I found care.com and I was blown away. Through the platform, I was able to find local and experienced candidates along with their reviews and rates, which were way more affordable than I anticipated. Care.com really put me at ease knowing that they were all required to go through a background check. If you're like me and you need to find someone reliable for your child care necessities, check out care.com. Find the ideal sitters for your child care needs. Welcome in here to the Friday Shoot Around. I am Ryan Gilbert. Today we are once again joined by former Wildcat Pearson McAtee. Pearson was our first guest on the show here just over a month ago, and he returns to the show. Before we dive into things, we are sponsored, of course, by the Part Time Beverage Company. Be sure to check out everything that they have to offer at your local local liquor store. So, Pearson, man, like I mentioned, we had you on here just over a month ago. Where do you think K-State has changed the most in the last four or five weeks? Yeah, hey, thanks again for having me on here, Ryan. Um, good good question. Uh, they've got a lot more, obviously, experience under the, their belt. Um, when you go through a week like they did with KU in Texas and you drop a couple, you're going to learn a lot more about yourself and your team. Um, and, and maybe that's experience that they need. We'll see how well it pays off down the stretch. Obviously, you never want to see a loss, but... I think the last time we talked, you were like, I'm kind of looking forward to see how they how they react when they, you know, when they get punched in the mouth a little bit. And so uh TCU game, they they definitely climb back. So just that experience in itself will should be helpful um as I get to the postseason. We've got two games to to dive into. We obviously had a big win over TCU on Tuesday night. Before that, though, was a, a pretty frustrating loss to Texas on Saturday. And that was a game Kansas State kind of had in its hands and and let it slip away in the second half. So I want to ask you, just as a former player, you know, what what happens when a team kind of collapses in a second half like that? Is it something that Texas just simply did, you know, very good, like they just ex executed well down the stretch? Or do you think that K-State maybe just sort of put on cruise control for the last 20 minutes and thought it was going to be an easy win? Yeah, I think whenever, you know, a tale of two has flips like that, there's definitely a little bit of both. Um, I was at the game and, and it just seemed like a lot of energy, um, and, and careless turnovers is, is what killed us in that second half. And so I think it was a little bit of, you know, Hey, we're up 12, we're at home. We beat them last time. We were able to outpace them. Um, and it was a completely different game this time around. And so for them, um, when, when you come out and, and you don't even get a, you know, shots off with the amount of turnovers we have, it's going to allow them to climb back in the game pretty easily. And, Obviously, with their pace, they're pretty good in transition, and that's uh, that's where we got back on our heels. And any game can be taken from you in the, in this conference. So, and let's let's give credit to Texas, right? Kansas State kind of, you know, like you mentioned, had, didn't have the best energy in the second half, but Texas played some really good basketball. Man, do you think that the Longhorns are maybe the best team in the Big Twelve right now? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously they're they're sitting at the top of the standings. I I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, that I'm I'm super impressed or think that they will will stay at the top and they're by far the greatest team there. Um, I mean, you, you've got a lot of good teams that have good ball left to play. I haven't looked at Texas's schedule, but I feel like they've got a lot of tough probably road games here coming up um, to finish off the season. Whereas K State, you know, we've kind of knocked out those top four or five according to the standings road games. So we we should be on a pretty good upward trajectory to finish. So. Um, yeah, they're, they are talented, but whenever you lose your head coach, um, it's going to take a lot more out of, out of those guys to dig deep um, from Texas. So, I I don't know if you've seen what Tang, sort of his reaction was. I don't know if you watched the press conference after that Texas loss, but it, it didn't seem like a good time to be a K-State player. I think he was was pretty pissed, to quote Tang, after that loss. And so I'm curious, did, did Coach Weber ever, ever do anything that with you guys, like, and what's kind of just sort of the overall messaging with Tang? Obviously, it resonated pretty well with 
you know, Kansas State bouncing back and getting that win against TCU. Is that something that you guys ever went through as a former player? No, oh, absolutely. There were there were times where we would win games and it would it would feel like a loss. Um, I, I I was a little sh- surprised. I'd say that's definitely the first time I've seen Coach Tang react in that way. And I mean, you could tell even walking through the handshake line. Um, he was very thankful still of the students going up there, but but he was pacing pretty good up and down the court. You could tell he was ticked off. And I'm sure the the coaches were in the film room, you know, all that night, the next morning early to get those guys prepped and ready at practice the next day. So I can imagine that uh that, that next day practice wasn't wasn't very enjoyable, but but it obviously, you know, paid dividends for them against TCU because they finished the you know, they finished that game completely different than how they finished the Texas game. That was the fifth loss on the season, the fourth loss in Big 12 play. Was this the the right time to to pull that card if you're tank, you think? Uh, I would think so. Um, when you lose, you know, the game before that rivalry game, you you beat Kansas once. I'm not saying that you can't expect to beat them twice, but when you're on the road, you lose a tough one like that um, where, you know, there were, there were fixable mistakes. It wasn't an effort thing by any means. Um, I, I think just with how the game went itself, you know, how, how comfortable we looked and felt in the first half um, to come out that lethargic and just drop a game at home. I, it seems like Coach Tang's got a massive importance um, on winning games at home and especially in conference. And so I know that was one of their their goals on the chart they have and, and protecting home courts, why KU's won so many conference championships in a row. Let's switch gears here and talk about this TCU game, which did snap a three-game skid in the Big 12 and I think that kind of gets overlooked a little bit just because Kansas State had that win over Florida. And if that doesn't happen in the Big 12 SEC Challenge, I think that a lot more people would be a little bit more concerned with the struggles that Kansas State was having, losing three in a row in the Big 12. But but like we mentioned, they snapped that streak against TCU. Just overall takeaways from that game, Pearson. Yeah, great point. I'll be honest, I didn't even realize that it was three in a row either because that Florida game breakup, it can just – they can just swing things so many different ways. Um, re- repeat that question. I kind of got lost. I uh, I I didn't even <laughs> just, realize that that was three in a row. I mean, you're right. It didn't even feel like that from not just because the media wasn't talking about it, but just in general because they, they got back on track. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, it just – I feel like that if they don't have that Florida game, it's a completely different sort of outlook, you know, on the season. And, like, look back at the Big 12 title team in, in 18 and 19 when Kansas State – ran the table in, in Big 12 play, but have that loss to AM, right? So that mm-hmm. SEC challenge, man, it's weird. People overlook games. People put a lot of focus on games that maybe don't matter in the standings. But just the question was just overall, you know, takeaways from that TCU game. And I hate to call it a must win, but that was a, a pretty important game for Kansas State to have, right? 100%, especially after going on the road and, and having such a letdown game at TCU. Um, talk about probably the only other point in the year where Tank could have – use the reaction that he had after the Texas game when it, when you obviously TCU was rolling at that time, you know, having miles go downs kind of set them on a different trajectory. Who knows if he'll be back or not. It definitely looked like he wouldn't be coming back this season, but it sounds like it's not nearly as bad. So for them to go against Lampkin again, down low, I know it was his first game back and he didn't play very well, but for our bigs to play a, a, a lot better game and to be able to actually control transition. I mean, that, that first game we had against TCU was, I mean, they looked like in the seventh and final game of an AAU tournament, like it was up and down track race. And so I, I know there was still fast pace in the TCU game, but to flip, flip the script on them and, and get a lot of turnovers, force a lot of turnovers is um, obviously what, what led us to, to being on top. And then I don't know how many we scored in a row there down the stretch, 12, 14, <laughs> whatever it was, but that was out of the blue, but necessary and, and shows that we can finish finish games at, at a high level. Yeah. Final score was a little inflated in that game without a doubt, but it was still a comfortable win for Kansas state. I think it was important for the Wildcats to get that. Was this a game that can really pay dividends for Kansas state moving forward? Or do you think this is just any other win? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's any other win. It, it's like being in a shooting slump. You know, you got to see one go through. And to your point, yeah. in conference play in such a copycat league, um, you know, when you lose three in a, low, a row like that, obviously people are doing something good against you, regardless of your energy level. They seem to have figured something out. Um, so to prove that they can get over the hump and see one go through, um, now we've got, you know, two unranked back-to-back games here that are um, – 
you know, ones where you should be able to handle them fairly easily, not saying it's it's always easy to win a game in the Big 12, but um, to see that top 25 win go through before, before a couple more, I think, is uh, – is going to help them, but there's going to be a lot more must wins down the stretch here, especially when you're talking about um, winning the conference championship. How about Tyke Green, man? I mean, I don't want to say K-State doesn't win without his performance on Tuesday, but I mean, where has that been all season? <laughs> Crazy. It's, uh, it, yeah. it's the true testament of being ready for your opportunity. And uh, you, you'll see guy. I've, I've seen so many guys over the years. I know I've, I've fallen victim to, it, victim to it from time to time. Like, man, when am I going to get my opportunity? When am I going to be able to do this? And he got his opportunity, and he he absolutely made the most of it. Um, you know, Desi did a, had a similar game against KU. I mean, he's almost the sole reason why we won that game. There's going to be a lot more games down the stretch where you're going to have to see different guys step up. That's just the way it is. I think we talked about it a little bit. Marquise and Keontae are so important to this team, but having a Cam Carter shoot the ball well like he did at Texas, having Desi against KU, having Tyke against TCU, those X-factor kind of glue guys that are going to step up um, are going to be mandatory if you want to win the conference and make a postseason run because you're going to have ebbs and flows with every game and and some guys are going to have off-shooting nights or uh, you know, a bunch of turnovers or whatever it may be. Um, that that third guy for this team doesn't have to be consistently the same person, but there's got to be at least one one to two guys stepping up per game if K State wants to wants to you know win this conference. So we'll wrap up the first half with this. Uh, is that the key to winning the conference? Is just having that consistency off the bench or, or from any buddy that's not Noel or Johnson, or do you think it's it's the interior defense? Is it something else, Pearson? Uh, I wish it was that simple, um, and and I wish that uh, that all these teams weren't so different. Um, that it, it would be a lot easier to pinpoint one thing. It, it's it's going to come down to you know resiliency. It's going to come down to those those games like TCU, um, where where it's a five point game where they should have had it in the bag. They let TCU back into it, and you don't drop that game. Um, similar to the Texas game we dropped at home. The more you can win those one possession, you know, under 10 point battles, that's going to be the difference. And I think for K-State, it's going to be transition defense. It's going to be not allowing second chance points and limiting the turnovers. And I know that's easy to say, because that's how we pretty much have lost every single game, but, but that's, what's most important to this team. We're really high powered offense. Um, when we do decide to guard, I think we have a lot of length and we can be good. But the problem is, you know, we'll, we'll score a basket on offense and give up a transition layup. Like that should never happen, especially at this level of college basketball. Um, so that'll be something that's huge, huge for him in the second half here in the Big 12 and, and in the NCAA tournament. He is Pearson McAtee. I'm Ryan Gilbert. We'll go ahead and take a quick break here on the Friday Shooter Round. Getting the crew together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly, they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. Whatever the occasion, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Welcome back in here to the Friday Shootaround. I am Ryan Gilbert. Today, we're joined by former Wildcat Pearson McAtee. Once again, we're sponsored by the part-time beverage company. Pearson, two road games coming up, like you mentioned. Is one of these two games maybe more important than the other, or are these just both games you got to win? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say one's more important than the other. It seems like OU and, and Tech's resumes are both similar. Um, I think Tech will end up being a better team at the end of the year. But in games like this, where you're expected to be a contender in the conference, um, and you're and you're going on back-to-back -back road trips like this, and and your typical trap game, um, you just got to get the job done. Doesn't matter if it's by one point, thirty points, forty points. Um, you just you have to get two wins when you come out of here. So, 
I heard you say you said trap game. Did did you listen to my my shoot around with Austin Budkey? Oh, I did. I, I want to give you a chance to to say uh, whatever you want to say to Austin on here. Go ahead. No, of, of course he. Uh, it was funny when, like when you dropped the podcast, we were at Lucha, um, and he said he said he said he threw some a couple digs at me. So sure enough, I I flipped it on when I got back, and um, you know I did I did clarify that I said that the type of game we were going into in TCU with a road top 25 opponent, I didn't believe that that would be a trap game. TCU obviously came out to play uh, K state dropped it, but that specific scenario where you're playing a top 25 team on the road, I, I don't think that's a trap game. If you don't get up for that game, then I think there's other issues than, than just not sure. expecting to win. So I will clarify that uh, since I'm a detail guy and Bucky tends to gloss over those. <laughs> Um, but, uh, absolutely. When you two, two unranked teams on the road, uh, could, could easily fall into trap game territory. So there you have it. The beef between Austin and, and Pearson has been smashed, I guess. Oh, uh, it's all fun. We're it's, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> like, I think I t texted you before we got all this going. I said, you got to get like a, a round table with, with me, him and, and Mason shown. We've got a group text that we're always bantering back and forth with. So I, at some point, I know you've got a great list of people coming on here, but I think that would be a, I think that'd be a pretty fun group to to bounce back and forth. Yeah, yeah, we'll try to make that happen for sure, dude. Uh, back to hoops, though. I, I want to ask you about Naquan Tomlin. I think that's the guy that's been struggling a little bit. And by the time this shoot around goes live um, up on YouTube and stuff, I'll have an article live on Go Power Cat about maybe taking him out of the starting lineup. I don't know if this is an idea that you would entertained but just the thought process behind this is, is putting desi sills in there obviously you get smaller you don't have that length on the court you know coming out of the gate but marquise noel is a guy that's i, I don't want to say he's like struggling or slumping but he's he's not playing his best basketball right now and so getting you know desi to run the point maybe that's an okay idea is that something you would support it or no uh, I think it depends on the type of player you have for sure. Um, I, I'm not necessarily in there, right? So it's hard for me to say sure. how he would handle that. I know with Coach Weber early, I think Dean, I think there was like one game Dean played in that he didn't start. And he came out of the gate firing. And when he came off the bench, that was exactly what he needed to light a fire underneath him. There's other guys where they just, they they need that continual support. And they've got to stay in there. Um, so it, it's hard to say for me, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far to say to not start him. Um, but maybe if he has a tough, you know, a tough first half and they're coming back out the start of the second half and, and you send a smaller message like that of, Hey, you got to get it in gear. Desi's been doing well or, or whoever that may be. I, I think that would be more appropriate in a game type situation. Um, I think, I think he played all right this last game. He, he didn't have as many turnovers, um, started the game really strong, but definitely fell back into that. Um, you know, kind of start of the second half, kind of before that last couple minute runs of, of I don't know if it was overthinking or just being too pass first once he got inside the lane. I'd, I'd like to see him be more aggressive like he was those first couple games of conference. Is it, is it easier to, to start a game or is it easier to come off the bench or is it maybe just dependent on the person? Yeah, definitely dependent on the person. Um, a guy like Jesse coming off the bench is huge because he just provides so much energy. Um, if he comes in and knocks down a shot or two or um, Ishma suit as well, those guys that can really score the ball at a high clip, more catch and shoot, um, more, more catch and shoot than a guy like Cam Carter who's going to be consistent on defense and he'll knock down a couple shots, but he's not as flashy. you got to have that second unit coming on with at least some people that are, that are definitely energy, energy givers. I'm glad you mentioned, you know, Cam Carter, because that's kind of just a sort of vanilla guy who doesn't do a whole lot. He doesn't score a ton, but his defense is solid. He's, you know, shown some flashes on offense this season. And, and he kind of reminds me of a dude like Mike McGurl, like, you know, solid energy. And you got to have sort of that anchor, that glue guy on your team. And I think Carter just does a, a tremendous job of that, doesn't he? Yeah, for sure. Cam Carter is, is severely underrated, especially for where this program is going to continue to go. Uh, when you throw a name out there like Mike McGurl, Mike's one of my closest teammates and guys. So uh, Cam's got a, a few more games to go before he can catch up to a, a Mike McGurl or create Mike like we used to mess with them with that postseason game. But um, going forward, Cam, with, with establishing this culture, with how hard and well he plays on defense, he's going to be the one that's going to set the tone for these guys. Um, Desi, Desi comes off the bench well and guards as well, but 
Cam, he's just got that all around game. He's not going to be super flashy. You know, he'll he's going to have some double digit scoring games. You know, he'll knock down three or four threes a couple different games like Texas. But the more that he can control um, who he's guarding or shutting down, whether it's guys in transition or guys that are scoring at a high clip on the other end, those are the guys that are going to make the difference in the long run for this team to win a conference, to compete in the Big 12 tournament, to compete in the NCAA tournament. Um, that, that it may not show up as much on the stat sheet. It's crazy how Carter got only just a few minutes a game last year at Mississippi State. And now he's come here and is a consistent starter and is one of the most consistent players for this team. But let's switch gears here and, and talk about the, the season moving forward. And this kind of ties along the lines of the next two games on the road. But Kansas State, unless something goes terribly wrong, is, is going to be in March Madness. How do you sort of bring that intensity, that energy night in and night out, knowing that you're kind of already in that field of 68. Like, how do you just, how do you lock in knowing that you kind of have already achieved that goal that you kind of set at the beginning of the season, which is to make it to the big dance? Yeah. Com coming from the expectations that that was put on the team, not necessarily that the team had of themselves. Um, sure. they've, they've obviously already over overachieved that. I don't know where exactly their internal goals were at, but I think they all believe that they were going to be in the tournament so the mentality they've shown all year with with one and zero next game at a time, um, still sitting at the top of the standings to compete for a Big Twelve tournament. I mean, if if you're not getting up for every single game knowing that, um, th then I think that this team would have a lot, you know, more maturity to to still be to to get, to continue to grow because um, when when you have something so special and so unique like that, um, that now KU's normalized it right with how many years they've won it in a row. But those are once once in a you know lifetime opportunity for even coaches that have been at K State. So um, for for them, it is going to be that 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 goal, that mission to um, you know have have a buy in the Big Twelve tournament for sure, because there's a lot of teams that could still jump them, um, and, and then have a chance to win the conference outright in the regular season. Those have to be the driving forces behind what they're doing. How much of a challenge is it to play back-to-back -back road games in the Big 12? I mean, obviously the Big 12 is brutal, but you know, being away from home, traveling, all the fatigue, the exhaustion that you get with that, how much of a of a challenge is presented there? Yeah, it, it depends on one where you're going and two how quick a turnaround it is. I think earlier this year they had the back-to-back. -back. Was it Texas and then Baylor or Baylor Texas? One of the two. Yeah. Um, when they were able to stay down there, school hadn't started yet. Right. So I, I know it's not staying at home and in your normal routine, but it's not nearly as grueling on your body. Now, say they go to West Virginia on Saturday night and they got to come back and go down to Texas Tech on a, on a Monday night. Kind of, I think Texas just had that with playing at us and then playing at KU. Um, th those are tough turnarounds. Uh, West Virginia's, I mean, with the time zone and, and the hour drive you have in between and how cold it is, it's snowing, all that stuff. We used to get home from those road games at, you know, three to 5 a.m., just depending on on whatever nighttime game it was. So I got the schedule pulled up here. I mean, 6 p.m. on a Saturday to an 8 p.m. on a Tuesday won't be horrible, um, but uh, it, it's definitely not ideal. You'd like to come home and, and recoup and, um, you know, go back in your normal routine. You've got your cold tubs there. You've got your different recovery units um, that you're able to utilize. So um, this one shouldn't be too hard, but but it's definitely not not the easiest thing in the world. Are you hoping K-State can just, you know, split these two games? Or do you think K-State, the expectation should be to win both? No, nah, absolutely not. You, you've got to go out. And like I said, it's, whether it's one point, 20 points, I, I don't care what the former fashion is, um, whether it's, you know, a, a both teams under 50 points, both teams over 100 like it was against Texas. You've got to find a way to win these games, um, regardless of trying to win the league outright. Two games like this on your resume, um, you know, where we're hopefully going to be uh, going to be a top 10 ranked team again. Um, if we win again this Saturday, I think um, you've got to take care of business against unranked opponents, especially at the bottom of your conference. I kind of asked you this earlier on, but what is the ceiling? I think I asked you this probably in the first time we talked over a month ago, right? What is the ceiling for this team? Has that really changed since the first time we've talked? Um, I'd say it changed a little bit. I mean, I wasn't going to put any sort of expectations on on the, or any limitations, uh, I, I should say, for this team. I, I definitely don't think they will hit 
the one seed at this point. Um, I think if they win the conference and have a great Big 12 tournament, they, they've got that, you know, that two or three seed type feel with with the for some reason it started to go back a little bit, probably, you know, four or five, maybe six at the worst if something were to go downhill. So I, I anticipate them being a high, you know, two to four seed. I think that's really where their ceiling is going to be at and where they'll end up at. Pearson, wrap it up with this, man. Kansas State right now is is seven and four, right? What do you think the record will be by the time the 18 game, you know, uh, gauntlet is over with? Yeah, eh, that's tough to say. Um, I mean, if they handle their business, right, I got, I'm looking at their schedule here. They've got, I mean, five unranked games left out of the seven that they should be able to win. They're, they're two, they're going to be top 15 teams. They're playing, it's at least their home games against Iowa State and Baylor. Um, I, I really hope they, at, at most, they would drop one more. Um, realistically, there'll probably be two games in there, probably one that they weren't supposed to drop um, and, and one of those top 10, 15 games against Iowa State or Baylor. So I, I guess that would put us at what, uh, 12 and six. So I, I think that's where we'll probably end up, but obviously hoping sure. that they can win out or, or only drop one and that should give them a good chance to win the league. Of the, the six top teams, Kansas State is the only one to play two ranked teams moving forward everyone else has at least three and so you know the schedule really does favor uh kansas state moving forward absolutely yeah it's 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 crucial and if we take care of business at home those are those top you know 10 top 15 teams um and then you just control your own destiny i, I know the road games are road games never easy um but when you're you're playing on paper a lesser opponent you should take care of business when you're a top team in the conference so um schedule definitely favors them like we talked about they've already got those top five or six road games out of the way um, but you never know what can happen in this league night in and night out you'll see um you know i think oklahoma's played some teams really good at home already um not that texas tech hasn't but i think i remember ou has already got a couple Did, didn't they beat alabama at home too in the sec challenge beat them by like 20 or 25. Yeah. yeah I mean, That's I don't know what it is you. about that building. It's, you know, but for some reason they're comfortable there. And so you can't overlook it at all, even if they're at the bottom of the conference. Pearson, I appreciate you uh, hopping on with us, dude. We'll have to get you and, and Mason and Austin. If you guys are all in town at some point, would love to, to do something with you guys here in the studio. Yeah. Awesome. Appreciate it, Ryan. You're doing a great job with this and excited to come on and, and anytime I can help and, and support you guys, what you do is great for, for K-State and obviously for K-State basketball specifically. So go Cats. Once again, he's Pearson McAtee. I am Ryan Gilbert. This is the Friday Shoot Around. Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562 314 4603 for complete details. Sunday, the AFC Championship, presented by Intuit TurboTax, is on CBS. The defending champion Kansas City Chiefs go on the road once again to face top seed Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens with a trip to Super Bowl 58 on the line. That's a touchdown! We'll get you set for kickoff at 1 Eastern with a special two-hour edition of the NFL Today, the AFC Championship, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus.